Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure of discussing CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing applications. Yeah, there's a ton of possible applications that scientists are working on in the field of biotechnology to do anything from, how about this, enhance our crops for food, uh, sustain sustainability, uh, de-extinction projects, bringing organisms back from the dead, like resurrection, uh, potential for curing human diseases, basic research, agricultural science, as I, as I may have mentioned. Um, all of these are really important, and this is part two of a series that I'm put, putting together with, with respect to applications. Now, um, if you haven't seen part one, you should go check it out. But there might even be a part three because it's such a huge uh, field and it's growing uh, every day. And so let's get right into that conversation. So in previous videos um, that I've made, I've talked a little bit about the, the history of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, talked a little bit about how CRISPR-Cas9 works, and I even reviewed it a little bit in the applications part one. But this time I'm not going to mention it too much other than say that it was, it's an adaptive immune system that bacteria have evolved to defend themselves against bacteriophages. So bacteriophages, as it turns out, in, inject their DNA into bacteria. And if bacteria are to survive, they can do that by taking a portion of the, bacteria, the viral DNA, incorporating it into their own DNA, and then producing a guide RNA that will target a future virus infection and by using a, a nuclease called Cas9 cut that DNA and, and, and render it uh, harm, harmless. And so uh, briefly how it does that is that it takes portions of those viral uh, DNAs that it, that it, that it cuts and it, and it puts them into what are known as a CRISPR array and these different colors, spacer one, spacer two, spacer three, are, are, are a memory, if you will, of past viral infections. And they're interspersed in between palindromic clustered repeats. And so those that CRISPR array is then transcribed in, into uh, uh, tracer RNA and uh, guide RNA. And then those two RNAs combined with a Cas9 protein or Cas proteins in general, which then will go out and find viral DNA and then cut it and the bacterial will survive. And so recently, scientists have been able to take those two types of RNA, the guide RNA and the tracer RNA, the CRISPR RNA and the guide and the, and the tracer RNA and, and produce something called single guide RNA. And what's really cool about that is this hairpin loop will attach to the Cas9 endonuclease. And this region right over here in purple could be synthesized in the lab to anneal with any target DNA the researchers interested in. And, and upon doing, uh, the Cas9 will, will make cuts and, and cleave that and uh, knock that gene out or potentially edit it or potentially repair it with donor DNA and then uh, add uh, unique sequences to it. So basically we're talking about cutting and editing uh, DNA and repairing it. And so in the, our, my previous conversation in, in uh, applications of CRISPR part one, I talked a little bit about extinction, de-extinction projects, so bringing things back from the dead. But I want to talk about extinction projects now. So this is, it, it, CRISPR can also be used, you know, to, to bring species back from the dead, but it can also be used to put other species down and drive them towards extinction, or at least reduce their numbers and, and make them uh, less problematic. And it's like, you, so if you hadn't heard of this before, uh, gene drive is an example of what I want to talk about in terms of trying to drive an entire species towards extinction or a population if it's locally. Now, the, 
the sound of that on the surface is that it's maybe that that sounds a little unethical to to be able to do that. But if you're the the organisms that I'm that I'm using as an example are not a human's best friend, and so the goal is controlling populations of extremely dangerous vectors, such as the tsetse fly that causes sleeping disease and and certain particular species of mosquito that cause malaria. Now, you know, currently, there's, there's over a million people that die uh, annually of malaria alone. And um, it's a real problem. And if we could figure out a way to, to, to reduce those mosquito populations and, uh, and engineer them, um, scientists are working toward that end. So new tools are being developed. Now, you're like, well, what can we say about this in terms of like normal inheritance? If I can draw your attention over here, the way inheritance would normally work is if there's a particular sequence in one, if it's a diploid organism, there's a particular sequence in one allele and not in the other. For example, normal inheritance would, would have those particular genes occurring in future generations, but they don't spread very easily. Gene drives can increase the success of propagating a lethal gene, if that's what we're talking about, entering in a lethal gene, or knocking out something, or actually delivering a particular genetic cargo, if you will, that will set the ball into, into motion, that will take the, the species down in a variety of ways. If that's the case, if it's in both alleles like that, eventually, It'll show up in, in the progeny, and it, even in, in terms of mating, it'll show up, and it'll show up, and, and so it's, the alter gene is always inherited in a gene drive situation. So sometimes researchers um, can use, or potentially able to use, the single guide RNA to target a particular sequence, and then Cas9 will cut it, and then it can be, instead of repaired, um, with, with a mutation, which is one possibility, another piece of DNA called, called homology-directed repair could be designed to fit in perfectly into that cut region and basically can replace it with, you know, I, I use the term healthy copy here, but in this, in this example, we're talking about maybe lethal copy as it can repair uh, a mutation. It could also cause a problem or a premature stop codon. And so this can be done by adding another piece of DNA in the desired sequence. And so propagation in a gene population, gene jives work well, and they work on a molecular level by propagating whatever that cargo is, that sequence. And it's guaranteed that no matter which chromosome is passed on, that it'll, it'll continue and ultimately result in the extinction of the species and maybe even local population extinction. So another example, in addition to uh, TT fly and mosquito, talk a little bit about Lyme disease. This is another problem that, that, that humans have, and you may be familiar with it in that the vector for this is, uh, is the tick. And so uh, the idea here is to maybe make the reservoir resistant to the disease. And so instead of trying to wipe out the vector, the gene drive could be used to, to make species that act as a, a reservoir for the disease uh, resistant to the, to, to the disease. And let me explain. So this particular bacterial strain is the causal agent for, for tick-borne Lyme disease, which currently uh, is present in at least 43 of the, of, of the 50 United States and leads to 300,000 uh, new cases a year. So again, this is not a minor problem, Lyme disease. And so there's a group of researchers at MIT that are looking to use CRISPR uh, gene drive uh, editing as an application to sort of vaccinate the white-footed mouse. And so these white-footed mice are rodents that are the reservoir of this bacteria. And as it turns out, if uh, the gene drive would allow uh, them to be able to propagate antibodies against that particular bacteria, and therefore that reduces the reservoir of Lyme disease in a, in a forest. And so therefore, uh, the tick wouldn't be able to pick it up and then transfer it to humans. And so um, 
pretty impressive. And so here are some examples in the field of agricultural science. And I, I just want to say this about plant science, not to play favorites, but it, hap it happens to be a favorite if, if, if you uh, are familiar with my, my past research. But the plant science is important in a variety of ways because it, it affects everything in terms of the, the ecosystem. It affects our, and the, the climate of our planet. It, 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 it's our food source. <laughs> and so we, we, all have a, uh, we all have some traction in, uh, in this, uh, step, this conversation about agricultural and food science. And so you're like, well, what, what needs to be done? I, I enjoy my fruits and vegetables as, as they are. Well, uh, how about how about this? You know, and again, we've been manipulating and selectively breeding uh, hybridization uh, and uh, uh, d d selective breeding and uh, transgenic organisms for for quite a while now. And so this is not necessarily anything particularly new, but it's just the pace and precision of which we can accomplish desired manipulation is uh, is really what we're talking about. So how about this? Apples uh, that aren't going, going to brown when they're cut. It's already in the store. How about potatoes non-browning? Uh, the proof of that concept is, is being worked on right now. How about coffee that's being produced that doesn't produce caffeine? caffeine? Uh, and, and that would also not only be an, an important crop for, for certain people, but um, in terms of taste, that could be a big seller. Broccoli. Okay, so I bring up broccoli because, you know, it's, if you're familiar with broccoli, everyone's like, eat your broccoli, it's very healthy, it could be one of the healthiest foods you can eat. But, um, you know, maybe the taste, maybe people or, you know, kids in particular don't like it as much. Maybe we could uh, manipulate some of the uh, genes influencing flavor and therefore um, increase its popularity. <laughs> uh, corn, you know, talk about one of the most enhanced genetically modified crops. Uh, we could get it to improve yielding. We can we can work on grapes. In other words, uh, another important cash crop that, that affects whether or not it's um, diseased and mildew and also affect its sugar level productions and, and uh, which would influence different types of, of wine as a consequence of that. Bananas are a really important crop uh, to achieve um, uh, resistance to disease uh, is, is an important CRISPR application. And soybean, uh, soy, another major important crop um, could be used uh, uh, to develop uh, herbicide tolerance. And so uh, that's just a few. And, I, and here's a few more examples in the agricultural science. So cherry tomatoes. Are, are, are CRISPR is being utilized to affect genes that control the size of the plant, the size of the tomato, how many fruits are produced, and even the plant architecture is being manipulated. And so um, it's, de it's developing plants that don't brown when they're sliced, as I mentioned before, and that you can also create resistance to disease uh, in future um, apple orchards. So in general, what we're talking about in terms of fruit, we're, we're talking about larger fruits uh, in general. We're talking about uh, fruits that can ripen at the same time, which are important in terms of transportation of agricultural crops. Uh, the fact that they stay attached to their stem longer, uh, that can have a better nutritional quality about them and uh, higher vitamin C levels and as again, resistant to disease. Another example of corn. So there, if you're familiar with this waxy corn, so this waxy corn is a particular phenotype that's been cultivated for a long time, over a century. And it has a different uh, starch composition than you know, quote, normal corn, which makes it preferable for some cooking uh, and industrial uses. And so the loss of, it's been identified that it's the loss of function of, of a mutation in the waxy one gene causes this waxy phenotype. So over the years, many uh, mutant waxy alleles have arisen naturally, but they're generally through chemical and radiation mutagenesis. This is how we've been creating new varieties is by um, 
allowing radiation and different chemicals to, to stimulate uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. But now CRISPR, Cas9, can be used to precisely delete the waxy one gene in a, in a variety of uh, elite lines of corn, um, which would then help it to propagate uh, in, the, in the plant community. How about this? How about mushrooms that don't brown? <laughs> so this came out in, in 2015. So pe people don't like mushrooms that when they the go to the grocery store, I mean, think about it, um, that are brown, they look like they've gone bad. And so how about this? Engineering CRISPR to knock out and cut uh, the sequence of uh, polyphenol peroxidase that causes browning in the cut button mushroom. I mean, that, that, and so that the successful knockout of one of those genes has reduced browning activity by 30%. So this is already underway. And, and th this is an interesting side note that I thought I'd throw in. So the FDA decided that, that these edited mushrooms don't need any additional labeling on the package. And you're like, whoa. Well, since there was nothing added, it was just disrupted. And so it's not a, it's not a genetically modified transgenic mushroom. It's just a, a gene was disrupted and therefore it's not browning. And so how about this? Um, how about those who uh, have allergies and that are really sensitive uh, to foods? Like, for example, one of the foods that I think that people enjoy the most are, are peanuts, but there's a lot of individuals you might be familiar with one who are sensitive, potentially lethally sensitive and allergic to, to peanuts. And so imagine nuts that can be brought to school, that children uh, with allergies are not at risk. And CRISPR can achieve that potentially, allowing more people to enjoy protein-rich, healthy snacks. Uh, one of the biggest problems in agriculture today is to, is, is to come up with new ways uh, that we can breed and have predictable outcomes in terms of increased yield. So that's always one of the big goals. You know, you get into the particular phenotypes that you're interested in in plant science, but it's always kind of about increase the yield. Why? What's wrong with the yield now? Well, you know, again, it's not just profits in terms of loss from, from, from pests uh, and also from weeds, but uh, we need to think about the increased human population that, that is <laughs> ongoing, uh, you know, every day it, it's increasing. And so agricultural science needs to be able to keep up with that. And so um, altering and enhancing uh, agricultural yield is an important goal of, of plant scientists. And so I can't think of anything potentially more important than rice. So when, when you're talking about an important staple food for, for uh, feeding the, the world's population, so uh, rice is being um, studied in terms of CRISPR modifications and application to increase its yield. And so there's mutations in a family of genes involved in um, sensing the uh, upsizic acid, which is a phytochrome that affects plant growth and stress. And so these mutations have resulted in approximately 30% increased grain yield as a result of that. So there's, there's hope. Uh, chocolate, <laughs> throw that out there. Not that it's imp as important as rice, but some some would argue that it is. <laughs> but uh, chocolate to uh, uh, increase its resistance to a variety of diseases, so that it um, can produce greater yield. Uh, wheat, um, one a, a problem that individuals have, maybe you're familiar with this, is celiac disease. Um, and so how about this? Removing gluten from wheat using CRISPR and therefore reducing uh, uh, individuals suffering with celiac disease. Uh, there are scientists at Cold Harbor Spring Labs in New York uh, that are trying to harness the untapped powers of CRISPR to improve agricultural crops, specifically tomatoes. Um, and plant scientists are continuing to think every day and how they're able to enhance uh, DNA variations um, that breeders need. And so an example of this is to reduce uh, tomato mildew. So what, what I'm getting at here, and I just want to pause for a second in, in this, uh, is that 
it involves not just the understanding of, of the mechanics of CRISPR-Cas9 and how it works and sequencing genes, determining their function, targeting, creating a, a signal guide RNA. And th there's all of the bio, bio molecular biology involved, but, there, but there's equal creative uh, problem solving needed in science when it comes to CRISPR and, and, and amongst other things. You have to be able to bring the creative idea to solve problems to this conversation. And so let me take you into a direction of, of human disease. And so uh, and this is a, a little bit, a lot more sobering of a conversation, but cancer is a, is a, is a real uh, problem. And it's been a problem for, for decades and decades in the, in the human populations. And so one of the most exciting applications of CRISPR in, in healthcare is in the area of treating cancer. And so one example of that, there's many fronts in terms of this, this war on cancer. But one of the, one example that I wanted to bring up in this video is, is called CAR T cell therapy. And it stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. And it could help our immune system fight off cancer amongst and other diseases in general. And so what we're talking about is that if we could uh, invoke a, a change in a, a gene that produces a antigen receptor protein on the outside of, of a T cell. So this is, it's, it's difficult to discuss something this complicated briefly, but we have a variety of white blood cells and, and some of them are called lymphocytes. And lymphocytes can either be T cells or B cells. It's the B cell, B, that produces antibody. The T cell is sometimes referred to as a cytotoxic killer cell because it can actually use receptor proteins to bind to, to foreign cells and to, to, to destroy them in what's called cell-mediated immunity. If we can create unique sequences in, in cytotoxic T cells and alter them, they might be able to attach to, like, chimerically alter them, they might be able to attach to cancer cells. And we could then help our own immune cells attack cancer cells specifically and therefore the cancer and tumor is eliminated. So the way it works is that the T cells are first collected from the patient and then edited using CRISPR to create the chimera antigen receptor so that the cell would recognize the antigen on the cancer cell and then those cells are then uh, grown up and then infused back into the patient. And so the, the, then those altered T cells can attack and fight the cancer specifically. Uh, another brutal, it, it, it was difficult, uh, just saying, just as, as a little sidebar, it was difficult to come up with um, some of these examples because all of them are really important, but just for time's sake, um, I welcome all of you who are watching this video or are interested in um, healthcare application to really spend more time. I hope this video is again the beginning of a conversation, the catalyst. But this disease, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it really it, it's the saddest thing. <clears throat> it it's one of the most common inherited disease, and it's it's. Uh, it's an X-linked recessive disorder, meaning that it's on the X chromosome recessive. And it, it in, in affects about one in every 5,000 males in the population. And it primarily is caused by a frame shift mutation uh, in the sequence of, of, of DNA. And therefore, uh, it influences the, the protein uh, and therefore uh, proper function. And so it can be paralyzing. And so without functioning dystrophin, um, an individual experiences progressive muscle wasting away until their death at approximately 30 years of age. And so it's horrifically sad. And dis despite the amount of money and research
conducted on uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there's still no acceptable treatment for it. But now scientists are turning their attention to CRISPR uh, avenues of, of, uh, of research. And so the, one of the things amongst others that, that it makes this disease particularly troublesome is that there's, there's so many, the gene, there isn't one gene uh, for, for, for this protein. And, and well, there, one gene, but, it's, but there's a variety of exons. So 79 exon sequences for this. And so recently CRISPR has used single guide RNA to, to edit exon 51 in a patient. And um, those patients have been experiencing more functional dystrophin protein as a result of it. So it's encouraging. And then um, lastly, in terms of human disease, I wanna bring up sickle cell disease. And you might be familiar with this. This is a horrific disease that causes tremendous pain and anguish in individuals. This is a normal erythrocyte or red blood cell scanning electron micrograph of it three-dimensionally, and this is a sickle cell uh, that's misshapen. Now, the function of a red blood cell is to carry oxygen through the, the body. What can be more important than that? And inside these red blood cells, there's hundreds of millions of hemoglobin, which is a protein that helps to carry oxygen throughout the body. When the protein hemoglobin is misshapen, there's a mutation to DNA, that causes the hemoglobin protein to be misshapen. It results in the whole cell being misshapen. And as a consequence, uh, there's a variety of, of phenotypic problems that can result of it. One of them is that the cell looks peculiar to, to the body. And so the spleen removes those sickle cells. And so you become anemic. Another problem is, is this just doesn't carry oxygen very efficiently. Another problem is that it gets caught up in blood vessels causing tremendous pain in individuals. And so there's, a, there's a many examples of, of, of difficulty. And so I wanna bring up one particular case study, which is uh, encouraging. In 2019, this woman, Victoria Gray, who had sickle cell disease volunteered to be the, one of the most anticipated medical experiments uh, performed in decades uh, was the first person in the U.S. Uh, to be attempted to use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing uh, to treat a genetic disorder in the United States, and so it's rather famous. And so, uh, a little background again on the protein hemoglobin. It's a this is looking at the quaternary structure. There's four uh, protein subunits to this, so it's a tetramer. And the, the, the DNA codes for, in terms of adult hemoglobin, uh, there's four chains. There's two alpha chains and two beta chains. And it's the iron that forms in the heme that actually binds the oxygen. So there's two beta chains and two alpha chains. So as I was mentioning before, the blood vessels, uh, the smallest ones, the capillary where oxygen diffuses and carbon dioxide is picked up, Red blood cells flow freely, but when they're sickled, sometimes they cause little blockades, blockages right here. And so that can cause pain and swelling. And so all of that, it comes from a misshapen beta hemoglobin subunit. And it all comes down to a single nucleotide polymorphism, which uh, instead of it being um, glue, it's valine. I think it's glutamic acid, and it turns into valine. And so there, as a consequence of that, it changes the shape of the protein completely. So what, it, what has happened is the doctors have removed bone marrow. Okay, this is where red blood cells are produced in the marrow of, bo of bones, and the red marrow as opposed to the yellow marrow. So the cells from Victoria Gray's body, were, they were removed and they were edited in using CRISPR and then infused back into her body, okay? And so the, the particular cells in question that were removed are the hematopoietic stem cells. So hematopoietic stem cells, difficult to pronounce, but it's the, those cells which will differentiate into platelets, the five different kinds of white blood cells, 
and also into red blood cells. And so this is kind of what we're, we're talking about right over here. We want to affect protein in red blood cells in particular. So Victoria was the first person that with a genetic disorder to be treated in the United States with, with the, this you know, revolutionary Cas9 gene editing. And currently, the treatments show no signs of, uh, of warning. It's making doctors very confident and, uh, about the success of the experiment. And so uh, billions of her genetically modified cells have been infused back into her body, and um, it's eliminating all of those complications that she was previously, previously experiencing, like fatigue and pain from sickle cell disease. So it's really promising. And so the promising results are encouraging to doctors and that CRISPR is now potentially useful to, for for many different human diseases, not just sickle cell. And so sickle cell, cell itself is caused by a genetic mutation, I was mentioning before, uh, in the form of the, the protein hemoglobin that carries oxygen uh, throughout the body. And so when it's sickle, it doesn't do that very well. And so there's organ damage, there's pain, there is potential premature death even in sickle cell disease. So uh, it's pretty pretty horrific. And so if I can get into the detail of this, I think you might find this particularly interesting. As it turns out that all of us have two types of hemoglobin. One's called fetal hemoglobin, and that's obviously produced when we're a fetus in our mother's uterus when we're developing. And then we have adult hemoglobin. And so the idea that the scientists had was don't try to repair the adult hemoglobin sequence, but try to edit the gene that produces the fetal hemoglobin. And so the hope is to, to restore fetal hemoglobin, and that would compensate for the defective adult hemoglobin that pa patients have that have sickle cell. This is a picture of the sickle cell under the, under the light microscope. And so as it turns out that fetal hemoglobin is made by the fetus in the womb, in the uterus. And why? Because the fetus needs to get oxygen from the mother, from the umbilical cord, and then ultimately from the exchange in the placenta. And so um, once the fetus is born and it becomes a newborn, the amount of fetal hemoglobin is reduced and the amount of adult hemoglobin increases. And so if I can mention this, the fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than does adult hemoglobin. It kind of makes sense that the protein of fetal hemoglobin would have a greater attraction for oxygen because it's in competition a little bit with the, the red blood cells of the mother. And so it can actually increase saturation uh, better than adult hemoglobin. But as it turns out, um, when uh, over the months, the amount of fetal hemoglobin decreases and the amount of adult hemoglobin increases. This is normal in, uh, of, of what happens. And you're like, well, why isn't fetal hemoglobin hemoglobin influenced by the, the mutation that causes sickle cell anemia. And that's because the adult hemoglobin, the mutation is in the beta chains of, of hemoglobin. And as it turns out that the fetal hemoglobin, though it's also made up of four polypeptide chains, uh, doesn't have, it has alpha and gamma uh, proteins. It doesn't have any beta. And so it's not affected by it. And so because the phenol, fetal hemoglobin is encoded by completely different gene, it's not impacted by sickle cell disease. It doesn't have the same sequence. So you can see here, fetal hemoglobin normally goes down uh, and beta hemoglobin normally goes up when, you, when you're born. And so this is the key part right here. So it was discovered that there's a gene in our body that is a regulatory gene. And a regulatory gene sort of has emphasis on other genes. 
So there's a gene that is capable of turning on and turning off the expression of phenylhemoglobin, turning on or turning off. And so what normally happens is that it's on, and then when the baby is born, that gene causes sort of the down expression of fetal hemoglobin. So there's a gene that says, okay, stop making fetal hemoglobin. And so the idea is to knock out using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, to knock out the gene, the regulatory gene, that turns off the hemoglobin. So if we can knock off the gene that turns off fetal hemoglobin, that means that the body will continually express phenyl, fetal hemoglobin, meaning the, meaning the alpha chains and the gamma chains. And so even though a, a patient like Victoria Gray, normal adult hemoglobin is not working for her, if we can keep the expression of fetal hemoglobin high, she'll still have enough oxygen affinity to keep her body functioning, functioning normally. And so what happens, as I mentioned, this is a review of this, some of her, her, her uh, uh, blood stem cells are removed from, from the bone, red mo bone marrow, and they're altered using CRISPR-Cas9 and a special guide RNA that will target the regulatory gene in fetal hemoglobin and therefore knock it out and cut it. And then uh, those uh, uh, cells will then be put back into the, the patient. And so, you know, again, this is what, you know, normally happens is that the, the fetal hemoglobin goes down and the beta goes up, and that's because the regulatory gene turns off fetal production. But if you can knock that off, then fetal hemoglobin would remain high. And so the patient then undergoes chemo uh, and to destroy uh, m most of those stem cells, and then new edited ones are put back into the body. And again, this, this isn't um, totally new, this part of it, um, the CRISPR is, but this is something that, that uh, doctors do all the time when they're trying to work with, uh, with cancer and sickle cell and, and, and bone uh, marrow tissue. So the hope is that restoring the production of fetal hemoglobin will compensate for the defective hemoglobin produced by sickle cell patients. And so far, 40%, uh, around 45, 50% of Gray's system continues to produce uh, fetal hemoglobin. And so um, it, it's pretty, pretty cool. It's very promising. And that, um, you know, 80% of her cells uh, uh, contain the genetic change that was done outside of her body. And how do we know this? We're able to uh, extract some of her, her cells and we're able to um, uh, extract the DNA from those cells and in using uh, PCR, we're able to look and, and say, oh my goodness, we, here's the exact modification and sequencing that we intended to occur and yes, it is occurring. And so there's verification that it's working. So nearly half of her hemoglobin is fetal and, uh, and that it's helping to alleviate all of her complications. She's feeling, she's feeling good. It's a, an incredible success story. And then finally, I wanted to finish with this. Um, you know, we're in the midst of a worldwide pandemic and making the video in 2021. And at CRISPR is even being used um, as an application. I thought I'd throw this in um, by COVID-19 to detect it. Uh, simply by using your cell phone. <laughs> and it's like, what? How can, how can Chris Root be d doing this? And so an alternative to PCR, which is real briefly, like now we take a, a nasal swab and we try to extract virus particle from our nose and then uh, using PCR amplify uh, those, those genes specific to the virus in order to detect it um, using a thermal cycler, real-time PCR, or even of gel electrophoresis. Um, but now what scientists are developing a test to be able to specifically identify the genetic material by creating a single guide RNA that will bind and anneal to a particular gene in, in the SARS uh, 
uh, COVID-2 uh, virus. And so what this new test uh, allows uh, is the attachment of the single guide RNA and then Cas9 has been altered, not so much that it doesn't cut anymore, but it can be altered in a variety of ways these days. And so what it's able to do is combine with a reporter molecule, very much like a green fluorescent protein, like a fluorescent tag. And so when it then attaches to that sequence, it'll fluoresce. And so when it fluoresces, then that light can be detected by a device that attaches to your smartphone. And so, you know, at, at, at a particular point, you know, this particular COVID-19 will, you know, it's here and it, it, it'll, it'll potentially go away, but there'll be others in the future. And so CRISPR could be used as a way to uh, identify diseases quickly by using CRISPR. And so Cas9 becomes activated when it cuts the reporter. And so it fluoresces signal and smartphones with a camera are basically turned into like a little microscope can then detect that, that light and therefore that results in a positive result for, for, for the virus. And so uh, two things in conclusion. One is, you know, can, the, the story of CRISPR and its applications can never be finished, even though this video, part two, is coming to an end. Um, but I wanted to point out, I don't often uh, refer and reference uh, texts, but this particular book, uh, the Code Breaker, written by Jennifer Doudna, again, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry 2020 at uh, University of California, um, is particularly interesting because not only does it talk about the, the, the history of genetics, but the history of CRISPR and her life story and how she got into science, which is inspiring, but it also talks about the current applications and future concerns because we're, I think, you might be wondering, you might have thought when you saw the title of this video that I might have been talking about designing human embryos and applications are to enhance human phenotypes in the future. I have a, I have a feeling that that is where we're, we could be going in the future. Uh, and if we are, we better be prepared educationally to understand those conversations and be able to make those moral decisions. And so uh, perhaps this book might be a good way to get us thinking in that direction. Um, I also wanted to finish by showing you a little bit about what I was talking about in terms of um, more recently, some of the uh, things that can be done with the Cas9 protein. I think you might find this interesting. But making double-strand breaks isn't all CRISPR can do. Some researchers are deactivating one or both of Cas9's cutting domains and fusing new enzymes onto the protein. So by fusing new enzymes onto the domain of, of Cas9, so no longer does it cut, but these enzymes could edit DNA, but it's still useful in order to target the gene of interest. Cas9 can then be used to transport those enzymes to a specific DNA sequence. So there you are, target. In one example, Cas9 is fused to an enzyme, a deaminase, which mutates specific DNA bases. So, so that's huge. And so we can directly target a sequence and then change a C to a T, an A to a G, uh, any, any particular nucleotide change we want to make, we can make. So that, that can either enhance or increase or deactivate, knock out, anything we want. Eventually replacing cytidine with thymidine. This kind of precise gene editing means you could turn a disease-causing mutation into a healthy version of the gene, or introduce a stop code on at a specific place. Which would then knock the gene out, or cause the, the species, as I was mentioning before, to, to become extinct through gene drive. But it's not all about gene editing. Several labs have been working on ways to use CRISPR to 
promote gene transcription. They do this by deactivating Cas9 completely, so it can no longer cut DNA. Instead, transcriptional activators are added to the Cas9. So, you know, the, the discussion of gene regulation is a big topic, but let's safely say that there's particular proteins that are involved uh, as, as activators and transcription it requires these uh, for RNA polymerase to be able to be in, invoked at a provoder, promoter sequence and therefore turn genes on. And so particular genes could be encouraged to be expressed using CRISPR. By either fusing them directly or via a string of peptides. Alternatively, the activators can be recruited to the guide RNA instead. These activators recruit the cell's transcription machinery, bringing RNA polymerase and other factors to the target and increasing transcription of that gene. Huge. The same principle applies to gene silencing. A crab domain fused to the Cas9 inactivates transcription by recruiting more factors that physically block the gene. A more outside-the-box idea for using CRISPR is to attach fluorescent proteins to the complex. This is what I was referring to when I was talking about the smartphone detection of, of COVID-19. So you can see where particular DNA sequences are found in the cell. This could be useful for things like visualising the 3D architecture of the genome. Or to paint an entire chromosome and follow its position in the nucleus. CRISPR has already changed the face of research, but these new ideas show that what's been achieved so far could just be the tip of the iceberg when it comes to CRISPR's potential. I would agree with that, <laughs> and I don't think I can conclude on a, on a better note. It is just the tip of the iceberg. And I hope those who are watching might someday get involved in CRISPR and uh, be part of the conversation. Thanks for watching.